Hello, and thank you for joining us for our sixth installment in our Lessons Learned from Industry Leaders series. My name is Jason Mills. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at KMC Controls. I want to take this time to welcome and thank each one of you for joining us. On our panel today is Eric Kruder, Bill Koopsch, and Maya Halsmer. Eric is KMC's Vice President of Product Development. Eric has helped shape the product direction of KMC Controls since 1998. Currently, Eric leads KMC's software and product development across all KMC product lines, including sensors, building controllers, and edge control devices. Bill is Vice President of Product Development for Automation Components Incorporated, or ACI. Bill has led the development of sensor products for the commercial HVAC market with ACI for 11 years. And he's developed products across multiple industries for the last 30 years. Maya is a national sales engineer for ACI, and she has more than 20 years of experience selling sensors and transmitters in the commercial building and automation industry, the last nine of which has been with ACI. Today's panelists will be discussing data centers and humidity control. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to add them to the chat box. We'll do our best to answer those questions at the end of the webinar. And any questions that we can't get to, we'll do our very best to email you those answers as soon as possible. I don't want to take any more time than I need to. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Eric. Eric? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, again, I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar on uh, data centers and some of the unique ways that they're different uh, from controlling a normal office building. Um, this is gonna be kind of a panel discussion and uh, I've got a few topics to work through. Um, I'll try to kick off a topic and then uh, we'll have a chat about it and uh, work, through, uh, work through all of our content. Uh, the first topic today is kind of just basic vocabulary. What is a data center? Why are they important? So uh, Bill, tell us what a data center is and then let's talk about a little bit what, why they're unique. Sure. So data centers are very prevalent throughout the world at this point. Um, so our definition of a data center is just a centralized location with computing and networking equipment. Um, especially in this time of COVID and more and more people working from home and kids being at home, uh, everyone tends to utilize data centers whether they realize it or not. Whether we're doing a video webinar like this or your kids are sitting at home watching Netflix or Hulu or any of those types of online streaming services, all that information tends to go through a data center. Uh, private businesses will also utilize data center to host their networking and data storage functions offsite. Um, and so these are typically buildings that are geared specifically to hold computer equipment, and they hold lots of computer equipment. So I know that in my experience, you know, I've been to many data centers uh, in looking at their controls and equipment. Um, it's certainly an expanding market. Do we know about what the growth rate of data centers is or is expected to be over the near term? Um, from what we've been seeing in some of the research I've looked at, um, you know, they've been growing at a rate of about 15% year over year. Um, and, and that's, you know, overall capacity, um, you know, organizations like Amazon and, um, you know, any of the major online organizations are building data centers on a you know, yearly basis. There, there's always new centers going up. Uh, they range from small facilities to mega facilities. Um, the overall revenues of a data center uh, with the projections going into 2024, they're projected to have revenues over $69 billion on managing online data. Yeah, I think the interesting part to me too is that especially with uh, so much of the workforce today being remote from their primary job, um, even more so than just working from home in general, I think our dependency on data centers has certainly increased as a uh, as a workforce. So. Yeah, 
if if I could interject something there, um, I always work remotely. So you know, overall, how it has changed my normal day hasn't shifted too much. But now, just um, the inability really to go visit customers, so to speak, or to travel to the ACI headquarters and be with my coworkers has necessitated that everything that I do take place virtually. So, so many more virtual meetings than otherwise would happen normally, um, et cetera. And when we started talking about this webinar and thinking about the topic, I was only thinking of myself and working remotely, but uh, just last night, I was like, oh, man, you know, when when the stay at home orders were put in place, the first thing I did was sign up for Netflix, sign up for Disney Plus. Um, I have a 14 year old daughter who was going to school online. You know, like most of us have kids that are doing the distance learning and that may continue in in the fall. So, so much of our work life, home life and entertainment is now taking place virtually. I can't imagine what kind of demand or increased demand that data centers are seeing right now. Sure, but that's a good segue uh, into our next topic. Um, you know, when we think of buildings, we generally think about keeping them comfortable, um, and we also think about how much energy they're consuming. So let's talk about the energy usage first. Um, you know. With so much computer equipment in the data centers, I mean, it's their entire function. What type of energy usage concern should we be thinking about? Well, first of all, I mean, they are big energy hogs. So, um, you know, some of the larger centers can utilize 100 megawatts of power. Um, and, you know, in comparison to like normal commercial office spaces, they're typically using anywhere from 100 to 200 times more energy to power that facility, to cool that facility. Um, so efficiency of data centers is, is really kind of a, a big important topic because uh, just because of the, the amount of power that these facilities consume. Sometimes these facilities, as new construction starts up, they're being planned where they can be near power sources. Um, some of that I've heard of are being planned in the northwest near streams so they get or rivers where they can utilize hydroelectric power to you know better provide direct power to those facilities i read something recently online it was uh, i believe a study or publication by yale university and it referenced the fact that some of the largest data centers those that would cover a million square feet or more are consuming as much power as a city of a million people. And in total, data centers consume more than 2% of the world's electricity. Well, that uh, that kind of fits where, along along as what I was thinking. You know, when I think of data centers, I think of uptime. Because when I want to watch Netflix or I want to get on a Zoom meeting, I assume the internet's going to be there. Um, you know, data centers consuming electricity 24 hours a day you know, whereas you could argue that a commercial building is a uh, eight to five or eight to six, you know, there's a there's a cycle there that we don't really see in data centers normally. Right, it's going to be 24-7 all year long. Right. So that was a little bit on energy. What about the environment that we want to maintain in a data center um, in general, and then let's talk about how that compares to traditional office space. Sure, so data centers typically don't have occupants or as many occupants as traditional office space. Um, the goal is to keep the equipment, comp the computer processors running at their best conditions. So that environment may not be the same as what a human would find comfortable. Um, so, you know, temperature, uh, humidity, dew point are all very important parameters when managing these spaces. Uh, airflow is also a big parameter on that. But typically, right, the, these data centers data are center. run at either cooler temperatures or lower dew points that you know, would probably make most people 
uncomfortable in a, a typical office environment. Yeah, dew points lower, meaning drier air generally. Right, right. right. You know, moisture is, is is something that they try very hard to to manage, and and it's uh, both. You don't want too much moisture because liquid and computer equipment just doesn't mix well. But you also have to be careful about making it too dry, and then having uh, excess static electricity around that could cause issues with the, the functioning of the computer systems as well. So on temperature, I mean, what's what's the normal range that we try to control a building to for an occupant? Well, typically, you know, you'll see office spaces from 70 to 75 degrees, uh, maybe as cool as 68. But in data centers, they have a wider operating range. Um, you know, they're going anywhere from 60 up to 80 degrees. Uh, and recently, they've some of the discussions at ASHRAE have shown that um, it's okay to run the data centers a little bit warmer. I think people traditionally think of data centers uh, as cold, dark places. Um, and and for the longest time, you know, keeping it cool was is the right answer. But the less mechanical cooling you have to do to the conditioned environment, the cheaper it is, the more efficient it is to maintain that environment. Um, so they're finding that you know, as long as they're living within the specs of the computer equipment, which can be a warmer running environment, providing they have the right air circulation, they can run these data centers a little more warmer than traditional occupied spaces. Yeah, I guess I would agree with all that. In my experience, even though we're getting a little warmer, um, you know, we typically have less humidity in the air. So you might be operating at one end of the temperature range while staying in the low end of the humidity range. Right, and and that's where dew point tends to come in and in, into their measurements. Um, you know, they may measure relative humidity directly on outside air that they're bringing in, but dew point gives you a better understanding of where the saturation point is going to be in inside the space. Um, and you know, like I said, the last thing they want to do is have water condensing out of the air and landing onto the server equipment. Right. Okay. Let's uh, let's move into a little bit of conversation about what types of sensors and things that uh, would be common in data centers for measuring these parameters, temp, humidity, dew point, and airflow. Sure, I'd be happy to talk about that a little bit. Um, there's likely gonna be a wide variety of both types and configurations of sensors that would be utilized in a typical data center environment. It's all going to depend on and be driven by the specification for the site, um, the uh, customer preferences, the building management system and equipment being utilized, et cetera, and where you desire or require information to be drawn from overall in order to help control the environment in the space. And accuracy is almost always going to be key as controlling to smaller parameters will allow for increased energy efficiencies. Um, with temperature sensors, you know, there's a variety of types of temperature sensors out there, and really any of them could be utilized, whether it's a thermistor or an RTD uh, or a transmitter, but we'd expect to see a heavier focus on transmitters, matched transmitters, possibly with NIST certificates, um, and the reason for that being that uh, transmitters are going to provide increased accuracy and greater span control when compared with other types of sensors. Typical configurations for the, the temperature um, would likely run the gamut that you might see in a typical office building, things like averaging sensors being utilized, probe sensors, room, um, immersion, maybe some uh, bullet probes, and where they're going to be placed would be you know, return air ducts, exhaust, on your coils, 
potentially on the server racks themselves if you're wanting to monitor the rack temperature, um, the chilled water systems, also outside of the building so that you're monitoring the temperature conditions outside to do your calculations and, and let your building management system know when and how much outdoor air to bring in for conditioning purposes. Relative humidity transmitters, likely also going to be very prevalent in a data center. Um, again, the higher accuracies are what we'd expect to be utilized. Accuracies of maybe 2%, possibly even 1%, with or without NIST certification. And that's all just dependent on how tight of control you're trying to maintain. It's going to be a combination of relative humidity and temperature that are going to help with the dew point calculation. Again, the goals there being to keep static out of the space and also keep condensation from happening in the space. A variety of configurations of RH transmitters would likely be employed in the ductwork, uh, possibly in the space itself, potentially remote probe or some type of configuration that would allow you to get sensing points out into your space as opposed to just around the perimeter where you'd be mounting a traditional room sensor. And then also outdoor air, again, keeping an eye on the conditions outside of the building so that you can determine when it's okay to bring that outside air into the space for conditioning. Yeah, in some of the, uh, in some of the data centers that I've been to, it oftentimes depends on the equipment that's also installed. Um, there is some equipment that has, uh, you know, cooling capacity built in, whether it's liquid or specialized fan coils to give, you know, cooling at the point where it's needed. Um, but it can certainly depend on the layout of the server racks too, with hot and cold corridors for airflow. Um, is there an underfloor air distribution system? Um, you know, you name it, someone's probably thought of how to more efficiently get you know, heat out of all those racks. Um, I guess the other thing that you haven't really touched on that is that is critical when we think about the movement of airflow is the is pressure inside the building and pressure inside certain areas of the data center. Right. Yeah, it's uh, going to be key in some areas there, especially like the server room, for instance, to be maintaining a positive pressure. You want to eliminate. Uh, any dust or contaminants that could be coming into the space and also the possibility of outdoor air leaking into the space and messing with the air that you are working so hard to condition. Uh, possibly also or probably also wanting to manage or monitor pressure across your filters so that you know when the filters in your ductwork are getting dirty. Um, some of the more common configurations that would likely be utilized are going to be duct static, uh, building static, so that you are balancing the pressure between the outside of your building and the inside of your building, uh, bidirectional pressure between rooms or between spaces, perhaps between the server room and the adjacent hallways, et cetera. Uh, accuracy, as always, is going to be key here. Usually, the pressure ranges needing to be controlled to are very small. When it comes to pressure between spaces, you know, plus or minus a tenth of an inch, uh, pressure between the inside of the building and the outside of the building, typically plus or minus a tenth of an inch or plus or minus a quarter inch. So the best accuracy you can get, and also you could see uh, requests for NIST certificates for these transducers as well. Um, what is involved in getting a NIST certificate for a sensor? temperature or humidity. Bill, is that something that you want to discuss a little bit? Sure. Uh, you know, from our perspective, it, it all starts with the request that you want uh, an NIST certified unit. Um, so here at ACI, you know, we, we have uh, lab grade calibration equipment that we're a lot that we're able to do comparisons to an NIST standard. So whether it's temperature or pressure or humidity, uh, we're taking a set of readings, usually three points across the span of that device uh, and showing how that device reads compared to the NIST standard. 
Um, so this will help verify accuracy. It will show any type of offset that a temp sensor or a pressure sensor may have. Um, and that will allow people to make changes, uh, put in offsets at the control system to be a little bit more accurate on the measurement side. Gotcha. And then when they order that, or they have to have a certificate per device that's installed? Yes. So typically our devices will be serialized at that point, and there will be a uh, a piece of paper, a certificate, a formal certificate stating what those measurement points were. It states all the equipment that was used, and it, it has the chain of continuity down to an NIST standard, so they know that the measurements were done correctly um, and that they weren't just made with some random device that we picked up off the street. Gotcha. Um, just to kind of wrap up our kind of our hardware component talk, what you know, we've talked about controllers a little bit, we talked about sensors, um, talked a little bit about equipment. What other peripherals might be common in that data center that we're trying to get data out of? Um, you know, there are a lot of other things to monitor in those racks. Um, you know, are there any other peripherals that we're forgetting about other than temperature, humidity, um, you know, in our normal conditions? Uh, the one other thing that I was going to just make brief mention of would be the importance of very current monitoring, current sensors or switches, um, being able to put them on different pieces of equipment in the site, such as the fans, to monitor for fan status, or to be able to utilize the information that they can provide to do things like uh, get your uh, different equipment runtime information, and or help with various energy calculations that might be going on. Yeah, that, uh, that kind of leads me into my next uh, topic is what happens with software? Um, many buildings have automation systems for their occupants, but uh, what does a data center need? And uh, I was thinking along the same lines because a lot of those BMS systems um, even inside data centers require integration. It's uh, not necessarily backnet and Modbus, you know, rooftops and heat pumps, but we may be integrating IT technology equipment, you know, like servers, talk on SNMP, um, you know, we can have energy metering and energy data coming out of the meter or out of the equipment itself. Um, also that we can have long-term trending, remote management and, you know, any predictive maintenance, um, detecting failures of racks early um, so they can be serviced. Again, supporting that 100% uptime. Um, you know, the more information that we can all generate, either from controllers or sensors, um, to be consumed and used for fault detection or analytics, the better. One thing that I thought was interesting as I was thinking my way through the different topics here um, with regard to possibly being able to remotely manage a data center was just how it relates back to the situation that we are all living through right now with the current pandemic. And the fact that, uh, you know, like, like us having to work remotely, you know, our staff at data centers also having to work remotely. Is it possible to have a data center function without being manned? If there's a, an instance where you just can't have staff on site. And so to me, it would seem like the ability to uh, remotely monitor the systems that are functioning inside of a data center with respect to the HVAC system would be uh, very advantageous. Yeah, I, you know, we've got the uh we've done some work with some OEM customers that sell specific uh, um, equipment in the data centers and even, you know, telecommunications huts and things like that, you know, so kind of a distributed um, data center almost a little bit. And uh, I'm always amazed at the information they want to pull out of whatever equipment is there, you know, whether it's an IP switch or, uh, um, you know, not so much dampers and economizers and the normal things that we think about in HVAC, but um, the span of stuff we have to integrate is certainly wider when we talk about a data center. Um, 
the kind of follow on to that would be, I have all this data now, who consumes it? Yeah. I think there's several different consumers of that data. Um, you know, the from a BMS yeah. point of view, um, you know, the cost of keeping that environment at the right levels is equal to the cost of the computing energy, the, the power needed to run all the servers in there. So optimization and reducing cost is, is one of the key aspects of keeping data centers viable and profitable. Um, so you definitely have the, that information that's feeding back into the building management and how things can be utilized more efficiently, even small tweaks. Um, like we mentioned, raising the temperature by just a couple of degrees in there to lessen the mechanical cooling needs could have a very large impact on the cost of running that center. Yeah, I guess uh, when I think of it, you know, there's certainly the uh, cost of running it. Um, but with so many of us, and I'm assuming that facilities departments and, this, and the service professionals, uh, the... Uh, service mechanical organizations that are supporting these these systems you know they're remote too they're not necessarily on site you know they need to be armed with information um, whether that's alarming or fault detection um, current conditions so they can decide i need to go service this today i can service this right now i have to service this tomorrow um, you know again all to ensure maximum reliability of that of that function of that building and those those servers right and right. to go along with that most of these facilities are very secure facilities you know th there's lots of private data going through these and you know with everyone being on edge about security network security uh, it's very difficult for someone to just walk into a data center so having that outward look on predictive maintenance and be able to plan your trips so you can get the right access and not have to go through some type of an emergency situation to gain access to the building is very important. Yeah, I think that's true, probably true for all, more buildings today, especially with data centers, but uh, data security and people security is something that, uh, that you know, we certainly hear about on a daily or weekly basis, you know, inside the automation industry. Um, I guess I, the last couple questions I have, um, you know, again, it's an offshoot of who's consuming this data, but it's interesting to me because we're talking about data centers. A lot of the OT, um, traditional operational technology or OT um, work is reporting up through IT groups now. So facilities may or may not report through the IT department and the IT may or may not own their building. Um, I think that's certainly a trend that's in money buildings, but uh, it's got to be more through a data center. So I think, I guess I'll open it up for comments. Um, what kind of IT impacts are, you know, are coming to the devices we make? Um, do the devices we make have to become smarter? Um, at what point does everything start to get enabled with communications? Well, I have a question from your experiences of, you know, there's always kind of been a traditional line in the sand between IT and the operations guys because of security, network security. Um, with data centers, I mean, have you experienced that wall coming down and more education from the OT side to the IT side? Yeah, I think the uh, it's the the bar for the OT contractors is certainly higher. They've always had to uh, um, make sure that they're educated and speak in, a, in an IT fashion to IT professionals to gain that understanding and trust. Um, when the IT departments or the IT run facilities guys, um, you know, absorb OT, they seem to be a little more open to having smart devices either on their network or managing them in the right way. Um, that may be, you know, I want my sensors and controllers to be directly IP enabled. 
I want them to live on their own, you know, VLAN or their own subnet. Um, I want them to be sandboxed somewhere if they're on a network that maybe has a point of sale or other personal data, um, you know, or other things that have to live in a in a container by themselves. Um, I think the line is becoming more and more blurred. And I think as an industry, you know, we, uh, we're doing a better job of talking IT and living with IT versus continually fighting against the IT department. Right. right. And, and with more and more network controllers and systems, I mean, it's forcing our industry to have to learn that IT por portion, portion of it, right, to be able to set up the systems correctly and, and segment data and that type of thing to better work with those IT systems. Yes, I would say that too. And I think that kind of gets back to the question I posed, you know, we're seeing data come out of everything today. I mean, whether it's a backnet controller from KMC or, you know, a sensor that's enabled with communication from ACI, you know, there's, there's a market need there to produce data that people can be, you know, that they can act upon. So a data center really is no different, you know, I think the uh, the cost of having a data center down is probably a little more impactful than a standard commercial building down. So, right, right, and and I, I, we've seen in some data center installations uh, almost a redundancy of sensor systems. So there's the ones involved in the direct control of the environment, but there's also another set out there for just monitoring, which is kind of you know the sanity check principle of. You know, and maybe that data is going more towards the IT guys or the analytics people, people for how efficient things are running. Um, but yeah, there's there's more and more need for that communicating data, and it's it's amazing how much data people want to see and can collect off of a modern system. Yep, I agree. Okay, so with that, I'll. Uh... I'll ask Jason if we've had any questions from the audience or uh, if there's any other topics that we can uh, we can answer. Outstanding. Thank Thanks, you. Eric. Thanks, so we have one question in that's come in um, regarding NIST, and that is, what's the importance of obtaining an NIST certificate for sensors? I'll, I'll take that one on. Um, so really it's about the accuracy and, and trying to run your equipment as efficiently as possible. Um, so as you try to control within tighter control bands of temperature and humidity, you want to make sure your sensors are able to read with the precision you're looking for. So by having an NIST traceable certificate provided with your sensor, you know exactly how accurate or how close that sensor can read to a standard temperature. So if your standard measurement point is 70 degrees F and your sensor is reading 69.8 degrees F, uh, the person setting up the control system can make that determination then of, well, if, if we're consistently across the range being 0.2 degrees off, maybe we'll be better off by putting that offset into our system so that we know exactly where our temperature in that environment is sitting. Oh, great. Um, and also, I forgot to remind everyone, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the, the, uh, the question box or the chat box, and we'll go ahead and answer those now. Our next question is, why control to dew point instead of relative humidity? You or me, Aaron? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can take a stab at it and then you can fill in the blanks. Um, you know, normally in a data center um, or a spot where you're going to have um, electronics, we really care, you know, the importance is we don't want that moisture to condense on the electronics. So um, making sure we're maintaining a temperature that is uh, above the dew point is going to ensure that we don't have condensation. Whereas if we're just controlling to a relative humidity, you know, that doesn't really give us the entire picture. Right. As the, the term relative humidity, the relative is the key point. As, as the temperature of the air increases, it can 
hold more water in the volume of that air. So it doesn't quite give you a, a true understanding of that critical parameter of when is when are you at 100% saturation, which will allow the condensation to occur. So being able to look at it from that dew point point of view instead of relative humidity it gives you a more of a fixed target to be controlling to. Perfect. Um, we just had another question come in on the NISTs uh, certificates, and that's um, are the NIST certificates the only ones that uh, are important, or are there any other kinds of certificates uh, that are available or that they should look out for? I think it depends on what part of the systems you're talking about. Um, if you're dealing with mechanical equipment, uh, you may want to look for UL certifications that make to make sure that the installation is compliant with all standards. Um, we've had customers ask for just general quality certifications that our sensors are produced to a specific quality standard that we've implemented at ACI. Um, but I would say NSIT, NIST is probably the most prevalent request we've seen. And our next question comes in, kind of goes back to the last one about dew points. Um, and that's when thinking about data centers, is the indoor air quality just as important as it is with a regular office building, or does the dew point take precedence? Yeah, I would say that in uh, in most situations, um, you know, ASHRAE is going to give you a guideline to maintain a range of indoor air quality that's acceptable to occupants. The range in a data center might not be exactly how you would control a commercial building where occupants sitting at a desk doing work and labor um, for eight hours. A lot of data center um, occupants are transient potentially, um, you know, at least through where the computer equipment is going to be. Um, I think in my experience, the conditions are more geared for the computer equipment or the server equipment. So controlling the dew point, you know, I have a cold aisle where, you know, I have a cold rack. I don't want to introduce a lot of humidity in there to condensate. Uh, I want to keep airflow going um, to give me a little more buffer between condensation and not. Um, and then the indoor air quality, while important, is still a back seat. You know, I'm not necessarily looking at CO2. Um, I want to make sure I'm supplying cool, dry air to that space. Um, the office areas of the data center, if I do have some office, is flip-flop from that. You know, there I want to maintain good people conditions, not necessarily dry air for my server rack. <laughs> I would say one other parameter of air quality would be particulate matter, and, and that's probably something important to be monitoring on your uh, intake from the outside to make sure that you know you don't have a dusty or very polluted environment. Um, as Maya pointed out, with controlling building pressure, that you don't want to be bringing contaminants into those computer racks. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right, we just had another question pop in. Um, are underfloor air distribution systems still common in data centers? And if so, does it pose challenges in temperature and humidity control? Um, I, I'll take that one. Um, underfloor air distribution uh, is still common um, in many data centers. Um, however, I think a lot of times you'll see a hybrid now. We want to make sure that the um, airflow is directed more so through the equipment and the equipment racks. So even in you know, instances where you have, uh, you know, the traditional round diffusers with an underfloor plenum, you may or may not have specialized VAD boxes that actually go up into those cavities too to maintain airflow through the racks. Um, you know, as to if it, imposes challenges with temp and humidity. Um, one of the big selling factors I see from our OEMs that do underfloor is that they can maintain the conditions close to where occupants are, 
um, or at least through the corridors, because that's where the air is coming up versus being blown in from the top or the sides. Um, so there is still some benefit to contamination uh, control um, in those underfloor systems. Okay, and then given the fact that, or I'm sorry, this is our next question. Given the fact that uh, data centers are using so much energy and they use it 24 seven, is power metering at all important in the management of data centers? Yes, um, I, I, I believe everyone's trying to gain every ounce of efficiency they can and being able to Submeter, various components, your fan systems, your blowers, those type of things, uh, gives you an opportunity to have some data that you can react on to try to change the dials to make a system more efficient. Um, and just having that information to know where your potential energy hogs are inside that environment, you know, gives you the opportunity to potentially redesign something or tweak parameters on how they're running. Okay, and um, the next question we just had come in is, are standalone units for HVAC still common in data centers? If so, do they have their own onboard controls and sensors? And how would you interface them into a BAS system? Yeah, I think uh, they are still common. Um, there are still specialized equipment manufacturers that produce, um, again, Think of it like a fan coil, but to be mounted in a server rack. Um, it really depends on who is driving the specification for that data center. And uh, I also think how big it is. Um, the smaller data centers, you know, certainly wouldn't have the um, bigger integrated equipment. So they're going to have more packaged equipment, um, maybe in the periphery of the building. Um, that being said, any equipment that is installed in those buildings um, most likely has a package control option available um, from that OEM. And uh, we're probably going to grab that information most commonly via back then. Um, it is still a commercial building uh, type of market space when you're talking about the equipment. So uh, it would be very common for it to be back net uh, as much as the other OEM equipment would be today. Uh, our next question is, are there any additional safety concerns with a data center? I'm not sure if it's a safety concern necessarily for a person, but uh, I think it, the biggest piece to make sure you keep in mind from a normal building, you know, other than the, than the moisture concern would be the static concern. Um, it's not unlike a, uh, you know, a manufacturing, uh, you know, we are an electronics manufacturer. We control static uh, to keep it low when we're assembling because um, I, I don't want to damage any of those electronics that people are touching. Um, I think you have the same concerns in a data center. Well, it might not be personal safety, but system safety is certainly a concern. Outstanding. Um, we've got two more questions here before we wrap things up, and that is, uh, are there any key software, hardware, or sensor features necessary for a data center BMS? Um, and is there a good, better, best option? I've got a, I can talk to the uh, software, the integration. Um, in a data center, there's certainly smart equipment there already. Um, so many times we'll talk, uh, you know, we're not necessarily talking back then Modbus, but you might be talking SNMP or OPC or some other protocol to get information out. And that's going to be important uh, to the system integrator if they want to alarm on any of those conditions. So the, the integration may not be to an elevator or, a, you know, a, you know, weather station. It's going to be something more IT related. Um, the other facet to that is we move farther into the, you know, IoT and machine to machine and artificial intelligence and the way our industry is going. Um, I would not be at all surprised if our system integrators get asked to grab information via a RESTful API 
or um, you know a published API of some kind out of that equipment or out of the server software that's running there. Yeah, and I'd say from a sensor point of view, I mean, we've definitely seen a trend on our end on better accuracy devices. So we see temp transmitters with RTDs being used for temperature. We don't see a whole lot of thermistor temperature being applied to data centers. Um, humidity, you know, yeah. the typical standard calls for around 3% control, while we, we typically see 2% or better being sold be, because of that, wanting to have that better measurement capability to understand those parameters better. Um, when you're talking about building static at those low inches of water column, uh, the higher accuracy units are definitely being sold more because of that tight level of control and that tight level of measurement to get that feedback into your system. Okay, and uh, I just had two more questions come in, so I, I lied a second ago. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, and that's this is a two-part question. Is, is Modbus still a common protocol for data center HVAC units? And if so, how can that be integrated into a BMS? Yeah, I think Modbus is still out there in uh, all buildings, um, data centers included. Um, the prevalence of Modbus compared to BACnet is certainly decreasing on a market share basis, but uh, it is still something that's very common in our industry. Um, we would integrate Modbus the same as we would in any other building, um, you know, with a control device or a translator or Niagara, um, anything to get that data, you know, typically it's gonna be trend data or meter data, um, you know, basic operation out of that equipment um, for long-term trending in the front end. Yeah, I, yeah I, we've I, definitely I, seen uh, a lot of our customers that still use Modbus. Um, I personally thought it was kind of going the way of the dinosaurs, but it's still very prevalent in the industry at this point. Um, as people have explained it to me, it's simple, it's straightforward, it's proven. Um, and it, it it has a little more simplicity than some of the BACnet world stuff. Okay, and then um, what's the best way to manage fluctuations in electrical and cooling needs, especially during a heat wave that we're seeing right now in Florida? So I guess Florida's pretty hot right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds like some place that I should go. Um, yeah. The, I think the uh, the interesting thing there um, with a data center, um, we may have less uh, flexibility in how much I can actually reset that temperature or set point up. Um, we talked a little bit of, at first about controlling to a wider range of temperatures or a, uh, the allowable range of temperatures is wider. Um, I may be able to work that temperature, that set point up to reduce my load, but at some point in time, I still have to maintain cooling to that building. Whereas if I'm a commercial office space, you know, that building could be shut off for a demand shed type situation. Um, you know, I think you're going to reach that critical point a little bit faster. Okay, and then our friends over at RLE didn't submit so much of a question as they did kind of a talking point. So I'll throw that over there uh, for you guys to kind of mull over. Um, they said, measuring airflow is critical in DCs, impacting airflow with performance airflow, uh, floor tiles and or hot cold aisle containment allows the mechanical systems to increase temperature in that space, generating a 4% energy savings per degree increased in that space on cooling cost. So I guess uh, they're, they're throwing that as a as a topic or as a, almost as a point to add to the conversation. Yep, I would agree. I would agree with that. I mean, certainly the uh, the higher temperature I'm controlling to is going to save energy, um, mechanical system energy, because I don't have to make that cooling. Um, we always want to make sure we balance that in the data center, though, with providing dry air into that space. So it's not quite as easy as, hey, I can run my economizer, 
hey, I can't run my economizer. I really want to make sure that that uh, um, that air is dry um, while not adding any of that static uh, electricity concern. So, right, and, and movement of the air is important. Um, you want to pull that heat away from the electronics. So having that circulation is, is, is key to it, which would then allow you to run a little bit warmer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some of the numbers I've seen is that, you know, the CFM numbers in a data center is twice as high as comfort cooling in, in uh, commercial spaces. So it's, it's all about getting that heat away from the microprocessors. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, let's do some closing thoughts. Um, Bill, we'll start with you. Um, for closing thoughts, what's the one message you'd really hope that system integrators or you know, uh, specifying engineers would walk away with, from this webinar when they start thinking about specifically sensors um, and data centers and humidity control? Yeah, I, I think people need to, to realize that data centers have their own set of requirements. It's more demanding than uh, commercial spaces um, and, and that they need to look at the right sensing equipment and the right accuracies to meet that higher demand that's required in data centers. Wonderful. And then Maya, kind of along the same lines, if you were going to sit down next to a system integrator as they're talking to a potential customer, that is um, that owns a data center, or you know owns several buildings that may uh, have or need data center sensors or controls. How would you advise them when you're sitting down next to them um, in order to get that sale? Um, well, I would strongly you know, focus uh, specifically on some of the things that we've talked about a little bit during the presentation today. Just um, the ability to. Uh, source and provide sensors that are going to have uh, the utmost in accuracy, whether you're talking about a temperature transmitter, an RH transmitter, or a pressure transducer, just trying to uh, find uh, the pieces of equipment that are going to provide uh, the highest accuracies along with those NIST certificates, if desirable for the application. Um, some manufacturers are just have different capabilities in in what we're what we manufacture, what we can provide. So, um, looking at accuracy, the amounts of certifications that can be provided, um, and uh, you know, keeping all those things in mind because they are going to allow the overall site to be as energy efficient or be more energy efficient than it, it could potentially be if you're not considering those things. All right, Eric, um, final thoughts from you. What would you like uh, system integrators and specifying engineers to walk away from thinking, you know, what, what's what's important? What, what are the, the key points that you want them to, to walk away with? And why is it that KMC is absolutely the best? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, uh, my my overarching thought is uh, with, with data centers is uptime and reliability. Um, we want to provide our customers with the fullest possible picture of the environment in that building. And in today's world, that includes both IT and OT. Um, you know, it's both audiences working together, um, especially in something like a data center. Um, and I think that uh, one thing that we do that is uh, really well is I think we bridge that gap um, for our in, uh, system integrators uh, in a good way. So that's my thought. Outstanding. Thank you so much. I'd like to once again thank our panelists, Bill, Eric, and Maya for joining us and giving us this time. I'd also like to thank everyone who's attended this webinar to this point. Thank you so much for sitting with us. Thank you for the questions and thank you for giving us your attention. If you'd like to share this webinar with your friends or coworkers after we've completed, there will be a link that's sent out uh, to everyone who registered for the webinar to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can expect that sometime within the next 24 hours. You can share that link with everyone. Obviously, there's there's no cost to view it. There's It's not hidden, it's not locked or anything like that. We'll just open it up to, to everyone who is uh, interested. Uh, once again, thank you so much, and I appreciate you joining us. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you.
See you guys. Bye now.